Hello everyone, uh, what a privilege again to be with you this week as we journey further on our theme, uh, Provision in Vision, and I'm really excited about uh, today and I trust that uh, this week uh, God has been stirring, God has been nudging you and you've taken up your binoculars and focused uh, and decided to behold that which God is sharing with you. And today we're going to just chat about the whole thing about the provision in vision. And um, I want to take us back to the meaning of the word vision. Uh, we find that in Proverbs 29 verse 18, uh, where uh, this word says, um, man without a vision perishes. And we see this also in Genesis 15, where God speaks to Abram and he uses this word hasa. Now hasa means, remember, to see, to look prophetically, prophesy, to behold, provide. See is a seer, divine communication. And what really just stood out for me was this word provide. So we understand vision is seeing, but the same word God uses is provide. Um, and that, that hit me, that blew me. And we're going to chat about that. And if I'm thinking of the word provide, this vision, this, what I'm experiencing, which I'm communicating with God, uh, which I'm hearing from Him. Remember, it's spirit to spirit. This is a spiritual activity, is actually the provision. The vision, that which we see, is provision. There is provision in vision. It's a different concept to provision for the vision. That's something different. This is provision in the vision. And, you know, I think it's beautiful if we think of how God wants to provide for us. If I'm thinking of Abraham, because we used Abraham's life uh, last week, and we will glean from his life again this week. He says, that which we, that which Abraham saw and perceived prophetically provided for him what was necessary. It provided for him what was necessary. So provision wasn't outside of the vision. It was in the vision. Now you see, Abraham, I think him and Sarah maybe got a bit impatient if we read the story of Abraham and realize what happened because Ishmael was born and, you know, that was maybe a mistake because God said, well, what did God say? Remember, God said, it, um, this vision is going to come from your lineage. It's your personal offspring. So we have this impatience and we have this missing the mark, you know. And sometimes maybe that's also what happens with us. We use our own efforts to make this vision happen. Um, and we sometimes miss the mark. But I think what is just so beautiful, if we look at that, God isn't put off or disappointed when we sometimes use our own efforts or when we become impatient say God you really need to hurry up now you know and I can imagine Abraham was saying hurry up I'm almost 100 <laughs> you know and waiting for you know for 25 years with that and but you, you see I think what's important is God is not you know, thrown and think, oh my golly, this is such a mess. What am I going to do with Abraham's life? No, what does God do? He nudges. Remember, he reminds him because why? He's pursuing your future. He loves your future. Remember, he sees more. And I think what is so crucial about this is, is when we make mistakes, you know, there's redemption. God did bless Ishmael understand but it's not what God destined for Abraham and I think that's crucial why I can either choose to live from my mistake and I can defer my future that that's up to us that's not up to God that's up to us if we decide that my past my mistakes in my past are going to determine my future that's up to but God says no okay you know you can choose are you going to live from life or are you going to live from death I want to live from, I want to live from life. You know, so that's what I'm choosing to pursue. I, I discover and I realize God is my source of life. And, and God is reminding you of your greatness in this moment of possibly maybe missing the mark, but he doesn't give up on us. You see, before you experience 
well, this is what I think and this is what I'm taking from, from this and I want you to consider this. Before we experience God's actual physical provision, God allows us to see spiritually. You see, um, I really don't think God's going to um, just drop something here in front of us, this massive resource, and just step back and we're going to go, uh, what must I use this for? Uh, why do I have this? I mean, God is a loving God. He loves relationship with us. I mean, that's what he desires and that's what him and Jesus and the Holy Spirit do. He, he's not going to throw this and go, whoops, and surprise you in that sense. Why? Because he talks to you about it. He shares with you uh, about it. And I think that's, that's so important. You see, God wants you to see so that you can experience provision. God wants you to behold. God wants you to have this prophetic communion with him and vision so that he, you can experience provision. So that you know he is your provision. This is what it is. And I think, you know, things that are stirring your heart, or maybe this week because you were nudged, things that are stirring your heart about your purpose. You see, it's part of establishing God's kingdom of it. That is how we can establish God's kingdom on earth. I think it's just so powerful. You see, maybe you stirred with the whole thing of healing. I mean, these are big things, but maybe you want to be a doctor or a physiotherapist. Or you want to bring healing in different ways. Maybe you're a business person and God wants you to do kingdom business. I mean, because remember, we're speaking about God's kingdom here. Remember, this is a spiritual activity. Maybe it's in education or equipping. Maybe it's speaking. Maybe it's motivation. Maybe it's nurturing. Um, maybe, you know, maybe it's bringing order in situations. Maybe it's strategy. You know, it's all, if we make our decisions according to what God wants to establish on earth, it says quite a lot, you see, because the thing, and you must realize, God needs a body to function on earth with. I mean, he says, if we're reading John 1, oh, I just love this. It says, God in me, Jesus in God, God and the Holy Spirit in me, I'm in them, they're in each other. I mean, it's this, this huge oneness we have of God. And then he says, I'm the temple of the Holy Spirit. I mean, but in all of this, God never forces you to believe. He doesn't force you to believe, you see. But there's this joint agreement I am having with God. Because, you know what, God wants to act. He wants you to give him access to provide for you. You need to give God access so that provision can happen. He's waiting for that. You see, God needs a body for his hasa, his vision. God needs a body for his hasa, provision. And I think it's a beautiful, it's this, it's this time where you say, yes, God, it's me and you. <laughs> We're going to go. And it's this concept, remember, we said believing. It's that believer. I mean, we call ourselves believers. We don't call ourselves doubters. I'm reminding you of that scripture that we used last week. 2 Corinthians 4.13 says, I believe, therefore I speak. So, I doubt, therefore I don't speak. And that's quite, quite a thought. And you know what? I decided, I, I believe, I believe I am the right person. I am the right human. I am the person for this vision right now, right here on earth. I believe that so that I can speak. I love this quote from uh, uh, Smith Wigglesworth. He says, I am not moved by what I see or moved by what I feel. I am moved by what I believe. Mm. I am moved by what I believe. So move is an action. Uh, there's this moment when I agree and I start moving and I act on it. There's a response to what I am beholding. If I look at Abraham, the first time God spoke to Abraham in Genesis 12, he was staying with his father. What happened? He immediately moved to Shechem. Immediately. I'm thinking of Joseph. Joseph had this vision and he shared his vision, whether that was wise or not. But in any case, he moved into the pit. Then he moved into the jail. Then he moved into the courts. Then he moved into the jail. And then he had this massive platform. I'm thinking of Esther. Esther moved. She fasted for three days. And then what happened? She moved 
into the king's court. There was a motion on her side. Oh, I love Moses, the deliverer. Um, he saw the burning bush. What happened? He moved. He walked to Egypt. He stood at the, at, at the river and he said, God, what now? And he moved. He lifted up his staff. There was motion in action with what they behold. Saul, Saul of Tarsus. Now, he's in the New Testament. We know his name is Paul. He wrote quite a number of books um, in the New Testament. Oh, I just love his story. And it comes from Acts 9. And I want to share something with us. Saul of Tarsus was actually, I mean, he was a Pharisee. He was, but he was a vicious man. His mission on earth was to kill and to put people of the way in jail or to kill them, behead them. I mean, that was his passion. He was totally against people who believed Jesus was the Messiah. And he was on his way to Damascus uh, to actually go and Go, go and capture these Christians. And on his way there, Jesus appears. A light appears and it was Jesus and says, he beholds us. And Jesus blinds him for three days and says, you need to go to Damascus and there you'll meet a man of Ananias. And at the same time, God appears, Jesus appears to Ananias. And he says, I want you to go to Damascus and you're going to meet Saul of Tarsus there and you're going to tell him about his future and what I've destined for him. I mean, Ananias says, are you crazy? This man is yet to kill me, you know, and, um, and in Acts, and I want to read this, and in Acts 22, Paul actually refers to this moment and listen to what Ananias tells Paul. He says, then he said, the God of your fathers has appointed you to know his will. Mm, no, the thoughts of God, know his will and to see the righteous one and to hear his voice. And now what are you waiting for? Get up, be baptized, wash your sins away and call on his name. Oh, isn't this awesome? I mean, God tells Ananias, you're going to heal him so that he can see. But there was more of the seeing. That there was this knowing and of seeing what God had purposed for his life. And then, then Saul goes and, and he changes radically. God did not give up on Saul. He became Paul and he spoke about the Christ in me. And I think it's just so beautiful. Abraham didn't stay at his father's house and... Um, allow things to happen there. No, he moved so that something can be birthed in him, what he was seeing, the Hazar moment, you know, and you must realize the ability and the resource in this vision is in you. You need to step, take the first step into this. Um, I love this. It says, your provision is usually hidden until you act on your vision. Mm -hmm. And I just want to share a personal story where uh, I was really just, really, God really like almost shook me and awakened me. And this was, this is recent. I think this is why this word has been stirring. And I, and I trust Holy Spirit is stirring you. Um, this was happened in December last year. And, and it is about our boys and um, the destiny God has got his voice and God has said very specific stuff to us and and shared with us and we also got prophetic words so we've kept well I didn't keep and behold this word over my sons I actually shelved it I didn't even bank it I shelved it and I said God this is this is impossible we cannot do this I can't believe it I actually did this you know and you know what God is so faithful you know the whole thing of multiple times with Abraham, God comes and he nudges me and Yanni with our own son. And one of our sons comes and says, he says, mom, is this not possible? And I even told him, I said, no, this is not possible. This is not possible. <laughs> and I was like, I'm shelving what God has said over our sons because I was looking at them. I was taking up those binoculars and looking at the blur in front of me instead of beholding what God has said. And you know what? We decided we are going to faith this. We are going to step out and take hold of this vision. But it meant 
I needed to move. I needed to fill out an application. We sat and we studied and we got it and we got the boys ready for what we believe God was saying over our sons. And you know what? God has provided. It has, he hasn't provided in full, but we know God is not going to do a half a job. He's not going to do a half a job. But it was that, it was that risk moment of faith, of me seeing, you know what? There is provision in vision. And that's where I physically saw this happening in my own eyes and in my own family. And, and I was like, so God, how? Could I declare over myself, I am a doubter? Because that's what I declared. Because I didn't speak it. I shelved it. I said, I don't want to listen to this. And maybe I said, I don't want to listen to this. It's way too much. I can't. I physically can't. How are you going to do it, God? I don't know. <laughs> you know, these things that go through. And I've got this, Paul O'Neill says this thing, and it really stuck deep into my heart. He said, fear is imagining your future without God in it. Faith is imagining your future with God in it. You know, when God shares his hasa with you, it's his thoughts. You know that his thoughts are filled with wisdom and revelation for your life. For your life. God's thoughts are not ignorance or not stupidity or not idiocracy that's not what god's thoughts are they are filled with wisdom and they bring light to your path i want to read the scripture to you oh it just so blesses me to understand the provision in vision it's ephesians 1 17 to 19 and don't you want to just read this with me or take your bibles out oh you version it. Uh, it says, I pray that the Father of glory, the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, would impart uh, to you the riches, listen, of the spirit of wisdom and the spirit of revelation to know him through the deepening of intimacy. Oh, to know him, the hasa, the understanding God's thoughts about you, the spirit capacity, the agreement with that. Listen now, it says, I pray that the light of God will illuminate your eyes. Ah, I just love this. Illuminate your eyes of your imagination, flooding you with light, oh, with sight, with beholding. Until you experience the full revelation of hope to which he is calling you. Ah! Revelation of hope to which he is calling you. Listen, that is the wealth, oh, the provision, the wealth of God's glorious inheritance that he finds in us. Oh, guys, you know... Uh, God is stirring your faith in establishing God's kingdom through the giftedness and the ability that God has given you. Um, he sees greatness. And you know what? The whole concept of hasa gives us wisdom and revelation. If I think of wisdom, I think of King Saul. Oh, sorry, King Solomon. I think of King Solomon. We ask God for wisdom. You know what? When wisdom came, his nation flourished in every area. He was the wealthiest king. He governed well. So when wisdom came, what's happened? I almost see wisdom as governance, as authority of establishing a, a, a place of order where life can flow from flourishing. And you know what? This is what this does. This is what the provision in vision does. It allows you to govern your life and establish God's kingdom through you. His glory on earth. Oh, guys. May you be stirred to, to, to see faith and imagine God in your future. And not live by fear, imagining your future without God. 
because God's thoughts, He is in your future. He's <laughs> you know, not not going to be in your future. Yes, and we are believers. And, you know, I want to end off with this. It says, remember, there's a, just natural resources. Other resources come, but there's a time where you have to step out into this by faith. Take that risk. I mean, faith is risk. I'm not naturally a risk taker. You know what? That's why I shelved that which God said of our sons. I shelved it. I'm not a risk taker. And God's saying, but what about faith? It's not a stupid risk. Understand, we considered this very strongly. Um, but there's a time of prayer, of conversation with God, to breathe in the breath of God and allowing life to go. There's this whole concept of priorities. You see, establishing priorities is key to an effective decision-making process. Because what I'm, I'm prioritizing God's kingdom uh, ways on earth and living and choosing where the anointing lies from. So I guide that. I guide my yes and my no with hasa. Um, and naturally then there's protection. There will be protection in my choices. My choices will protect the vision to, to come to the fore in this. Then, I just love this. There's this peace of knowing there's this peace of knowing that god will not disappoint me in this you know um, even in our situation um, he will not disappoint i know he won't disappoint me i do not have the full provision but god will not just it's not it's not who he is and it's that and it's that thing that we have to god is you know a mindset of lack destroys vision a mindset of a lack destroys vision. And I choose not to think there because my God is a God who provides. I'm not talking about prosperity thinking now, guys. This is, remember, this is a spiritual activity that we are downloading and earthing on this world. Um, so I want to leave this with you. There's provision in your vision. There's this beholding. There's the seeing. There's the believing. There's the confessing. There's the moving. There's the faith into the governance that God has for your life. And may you be blessed. Remember, your lives bless earth. That's why you're here. You're here to establish family. I want to encourage you wherever you are in the world, step out with that which God has, has shown you. And I want to challenge you, look, behold, and then step out. May you be blessed. May Holy Spirit encourage you today as you by faith live life in abundance.